Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Peter Jones. Uh, just want to give it a couple of seconds to get the last few attendees on board before we start. Uh, basically, we're going to run through a presentation on how to boost your cyber risk management program and capabilities, looking inwards uh, on problems and how to, how to make the best use of those problems to make the system better. So we'll just give it a couple of more, couple of more seconds and then we'll begin properly. So make sure you're sitting comfortably. Okay. <clears throat> so who am I and why should I be talking today? I always find an interesting point when you uh, listen to any presentation. So who am I? Well, I'm an author of multiple courses that are Crest accredited uh, in the UK. A course called the DAFI, which is all about intrusion analysis and digital forensics. Uh, I've wrote courses around penetration testing, information security system, and so on. Uh, so when it comes to bad guys getting in and breaking into systems, I know quite a bit about it. I'm also the co-founder of something called Southwest Cybersecurity Cluster, where we help other businesses improve their systems. So to ensure they have a solid cybersecurity and information security background, our foundation to get going. Part of that is I am an information security management system and forensic technical assessor in the UK to make sure what people put in policies and procedures is actually what it says it is. And we're going to talk about that this afternoon uh, in the sort of things I look for beyond just getting your straightforward accreditation or your your wish to become compliant. I am an auditor. I like looking for these type of things, but I'm also an investigator. My background has been around uh, digital forensics for the past 10 years. So finding out, investigating disaster, shall we say. And I do have a law enforcement background as well. So how we apply forensic knowledge into an information security management system and making a stronger system quite often gets neglected. I'm an incident responder. I'm also a professional of various bodies like the PCB, IRCA and the ISP. But more importantly, what we're here today to do is to understand your organization in crisis. When something goes wrong within a business, this is when your policies and procedures get tested to the limits. And quite often with a very immature system, these things take time to come to fruition. A lot of people I spend time with, I like to tell them problems are good things. As long as we're avoiding the data breaches, these are opportunities to learn. And we'll talk about that shortly. However, dealing with exploitation, dealing with problems, there are great opportunities to really learn about the level of maturity in your organization. A real opportunity to know, actually, does all this documentation that looks good work? Is it efficient? Is it effective? John Chambers, who was a former chief executive of Cisco, said there are two types of companies. Those who have been hacked, and those who don't know yet have been hacked. And hacked is obviously a term that could be defined uh, as anything you want, but it typically gets associated with something technical. What we want to look at is hack, as in somebody getting something that they're not authorized to get, to retrieve, to exfiltrate, to take outside the business. They're the sort of things we want to look at. What we, what we have is the incorrect type of controls in place 
to either internal or external problems. What we need to achieve is protection of information. For a long time, we still refer to information as something that's been printed off. However, the reality is information comes in various forms. And we don't, we don't just consider the, the paper and how the paper has been locked away. We consider code, intellectual property, social media, how the social media reflects on the business, the types of formats. There's a big push to how we consider the practicalities of protecting information. What we are trying to do is preserve the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of the information. I'm a firm believer of productivity breeds security. Hardening a system, hardening an office, may not actually be practical or cost effective. We should use information that we're going to gather over the next 30, 40 minutes or so to develop a strategy of, OK, what information streams do we have? What data flows do we have? Is it printed? Is it digital? Is it code? Who has access to it? Where is it available? Where's the authenticity? Where's the accountability? The non-repudiation of the data? And is it what it says it is? You just got to look in the news. And the biggest problem I see from my role is the news never truly, shall we say, for want of a better expression, reflects the reality of the breach. What we tend to see in the news is the big names. And even when I put this presentation together, looking at these dates, they're quite surprising, the big names and the ripple effects we're still feeling now. We just got to look at Target in the US, a very large superstore that was affected by a breach, but it was a third party that was the problem. They were the weakest link in the Target chain. But yet, when we read reports, who, who are the prominent name? Well, the prominent name is still Target. They're the one with the breach. Could you name the name of the third party? Probably not. On a side note, when we talk about things like GDPR legislation and the evolution of an information security management system, we should be looking at our partners, our suppliers. Who supplies us? Who do we supply? Are we consistent in the message? And this may be very, very techy, but bear with me with the, with the methodology. Bluetooth is a great example of supply chain weakness. Every, near enough every device, every mobile phone, shall we say, comes with a version of Bluetooth. However, different versions of Bluetooth have different capabilities. And when two Bluetooth devices connect, they will work on the lowest possible denominator of security that the both devices will connect. So, for example, if one device is running on Bluetooth 2 and another device is Bluetooth 3, the Bluetooth 3 device will run on Bluetooth 2. Very rudimentary. It's more to get the point across, the, the analogy. Sony were another one. Was it a PR stunt? It's very coincidental. We get on the phone. But probably the first time we started discussing nation states. When I say first time discussing, first time discussing it in the media. There was a lot of accusations about from Korea. Uh, from the US, sorry, blaming Korea. Was it real? Was it not? However, the, from that ripple effect, it's again, who has access to what? The reason I put Ashley Madison on there for 2015 brings another concept to the fold secure by design. In the media, they were probably the first company we heard about that said, we have zero pounds budget for security. We want the product out there. We want our clientele to use our services. Imagine what would happen if it was secure by design. That little bit of investment 
could have actually saved them probably billions. In the UK, more prominent and actually something in the UK we're still feeling the ripples of is from the Talk Talk breach. So Talk Talk are a ISP in the UK. They supply telecoms, broadband, and they were breached through uh, a vulnerability uh, on their in their infrastructure that they were notified about, but it wasn't it wasn't dealt with in a, in a particular timely fashion. Uh, we won't go into the politics of that. However, the, this is probably, again, arguably a different type of news article, but we heard about script kiddies. Well, in forensics, we've been we've talked about script kiddies for years. The problem is how it was perceived in the news probably didn't really reflect the reality of what was going on. And Equifax, they, they and another very large company, particularly affected the US, where they actually try to cover up the breach. They didn't notify the right people. And in the end, there's still problems ongoing. So my point is, these different types of news articles, there are little subtle points we can take into our businesses, regardless of size, supply chain, accountability, non-repudiation availability, secure by design, acting and learning with vulnerabilities that have been told to us and not to cover up. Well, that should be the same regardless of what business. Two other elements that I just want to touch upon is the uh, NHS. Again, uh, it's a medical service within the UK uh, where we can get free healthcare. was affected by the WannaCry outbreak. The reality is WannaCry hit lots of businesses. But the NHS probably arguably affected the UK the most. And it's a similar thing to the talk talk elements. A number of trusts were told about it, they just didn't act upon it. And that's what an ISMS should be about. Learning from things that's gone wrong. And I can tell you these businesses are probably are learning. Some of them are quick fixes, probably some of them are not so quick fixes. Um, something big had to happen though for those businesses to start investing. The problem is they've already lost money, lots of money doing remediation. There is an element of reality to all this though. Like I said earlier, not all businesses actually make the news. Some very, very small businesses get hit and actually the consequences aren't just dealing with the fines or dealing with the remediation. Some of these businesses could be closed down full stop. Devon and Cornwall Police, a constabulary uh, very close to uh, uh, where I used to work, um, suffered a, a DDoS attack on their website. At one point, they were going to cover it up. But they decided, no, we need to be up front. We need to be demonstrating to our public actually something did happen and we should be taking steps to avoid it in the future. That's a great example. However, when you look a bit further down, we've got a large holiday resort who in principle was a big field for camping in a very, very sunny area of the UK, which I know is quite hard to believe. Their entire back end booking system was on Linux at the time where everybody else was suffering from WannaCry. And before you shout at me, WannaCry obviously affected Windows systems, didn't affect Linux. However, there was a Linux outbreak. Luckily, Bitdefender had uh, a solution. In this case, though, they lost all their bookings for last summer. And for a small campsite who depend on that income, that's devastating. And also, additionally, their problem was their IT supplier, who uh, local to the business, who offered a backup system, who offered an alternative server, never tested the backups. Didn't understand if they worked or not. Nobody was testing it. Nobody was checking their capabilities. Genius manufacturer was in a very, very similar boat. However, 
the, the reality to both scenarios is the targets. The jeans company, the campsite are no different to the big companies. But what we want to do is learn, learn what's happening in the media. Take those simple lessons and actually look inwards because those crises can develop the good bits out of your business. Because at the end of the day, how you handle the information is very important. Not just your client's information, your colleagues' information, your family's information. Your customers entrust the information with you. It's just in 2018, they're getting better understanding it. I won't say completely, but they're getting better. But remember, it is your customers and your colleagues that are the main people here. If you misuse or lose personal information, it could cause serious harm and distress to a lot of people concerned. Finding a scapegoat, as some businesses do, is not the best way of going about it. And more you learn about your system, the more you learn about potential problems that realistically can affect your organization and mature your ISMS, the better you'll be able to deal with these problems and hopefully avoid them full stop. So this came from Price Waterhouse Cooper. This is the 2017 uh, survey, information security survey they do every year. And it's still the case where fraudulent emails, phishing emails, are still the number one threat. And these are actual breaches that have happened. So it's an old fashioned way of working. It's an old fashioned type of fraud, but it's still rife. Who's learning? What are we putting in place to actually say, oh, let's stop this happening? And one of those parts is training. And we'll talk about training shortly. Virus, spyware, malware, still an issue. Still having adequate products on your network. And who tests that? Well, quite often or not, particularly in my experience, the acceptance criteria of a anti-malware checker is a price. Any good CISO information security manager hopefully should push that issue back. But do you ever test it? Oh, it works, it doesn't slow it down the system, it gives us a performance, it's not memory hungry, it must work. Or well, actually, does anybody actually try putting a virus on the system? Do we actually know it's gonna work? Well, sandbox it, create that environment to actually see if it works. You can also get ransomware. There is some excellent simulators that can be run through uh, from companies like who I work for, 3B, um, that are excellent at seeing what happens when a ransomware attack happens. You don't actually have to put real ransomware in your system. But what worries me is these aren't new. Fraudulent emails, malware, ransomware, they're not you. There is a middle one in there that's the masquerading, the other impersonating organizations and emails and online. It's nothing new. And what's a common thing? Humans, people actually triggering um, exe files, PDFs, and what we do to learn about it, put more technical controls in place. Well, actually, the technical control might not be the answer because we're not learning from these problems. What we should be doing is looking at the maturity of our systems. A common thing I see as an auditor and an assessor is the year-on-year -year surveillance audits. It's about ticking that box for one of a better expression, making sure we're still at the level we're at. But what we want to see is that you're learning from it. You drive into that next level. So this is, how I perceive it should happen. Usually when you implement an information security system, it's, it's ad hoc, something's triggered it. Hopefully not because of a breach, it may be because of contractual, it may be a, a legal requirement, it may be something that says that you've got to have something in place, otherwise you can't have our business. And then typically it's infrastructure based. 
IT driven, technical, well, let's get the technical elements right. Let's put the right infrastructure to be actually support this information security system that we're developing. And some people can jump straight to this stage. When you look at the compliance based element, so this could happen by your third year. So this can be a slow curve. But let's say this is on a year to year basis. Your compliance base is you've gone to whole hog of 27,001. You've, you've implemented the mandatory, the non mandatory documentation, and you're really driving that risk management through. Understanding what annex controls need to be put in place why they're in place and how to continue and improve them because you're learning from um, previous issues and then you start okay what other threats are to our business what threat intelligence is out there well we all run windows systems okay what are we doing to make sure we are mitigating potential problems that could affect a windows system and you're pulling in those external data sources to drive this information security to another level. And then you, when you talk about risk-based, yes, you could probably argue this is mixed with compliance-based. But what you're doing is you're looking at 27,005. What can we do better? What other risks are we not considering about the business? Could we be better at how we manage our risks? So what our criteria was, a couple of years ago, as the criteria changed, as the business appetite changed. And this lovely synchronous system towards the end is business alignment, where what the business wants is what security wants, and what security wants is what business wants. And the business is driving productivity, which is breeding the security element. Security is no longer playing second, second fiddle. So if the company wants to make sales, wants a great compliance, and they want a great um, reputation and return, security is helping them drive that. But again, this red arrow, it's about learning. It's about actually going through the maturity. You don't automatically get to that next step. So part of this process is the, pr the preparation. What, what's going on? What do we need to implement? Are we actually going to implement something that's going to be any good? So let's talk about our anti-malware again. So we've got a price, slightly more expensive than these guys. It's got all these features. Do they work? Well, we're going to assess that. Okay, we're going to put on some test servers. Are those test servers realistic to the business? Yes, we think so. We're going to, it's going to pass all the flying colors. So we're, we're going to say 30 days, approximately. And we're going to plan how we're going to roll it out. We're going to roll out all the necessary systems and all the necessary servers. And then we'll actually deliver. We're going to do the acting. We're actually going to find out, we're going to actually get them installed in the system. It's not happens overnight. We're going to, these are all approximate figures, by the way. It's going to take about 45 days. And it's the last point that normally gets missed. So the first four steps, probably sucking eggs. You probably understand that already. You're doing the preparation already. You're doing the assessment already. Doing planning, delivery. Is it any good? Is it working? Is it, is it real to what the business needs? And this should be happening for anything you implement. So not just the anti malware, this could be a policy change, how you deal with incident management, are the things you put in for uh, mitigating controls, do they work? It's okay to go backwards. If you put something in place and it doesn't work, just roll it back and find another solution as long as you're constantly communicating. Usually the information security management team or people are very small in a big organization. You want everybody on side. You want people to understand what's going on. Because if it does go wrong, you want those people reporting back to you going, sorry, this is not working, Pete. Or if you implemented something in my system, we're finding it too hard to work. Because what you don't want is them circumnavigating the things you put in place. Because that could cause you even more problems. So what we want is we want to build up this capability roadmap. We want this organization to be able to continue doing what it does. 
you know, it's got to make money. It's got to provide that service. It's got to provide that product. But we've got to do it in a very intelligent way. So we want to start developing an information security strategy. Not just, let's get everything in place. Let's just, let's just crack things out there. We want to understand what the business is up to. Okay, business, what are we doing? How are we doing it? Oh, you want to start selling a new product in next year? You're developing this new product. Well, how can we help that? How can we help the considerations? Well, what have we learned so far? Well, let's look at, learn about what's happened to other businesses. Let's look about the things that can affect our business on a technical level. What capabilities do we have already technically? And this could be hardware, people, um, security. Um, what's our threat intelligence? Well, we don't have the room to put the servers anywhere. Okay, what can we do about it? Well, you're not going to leave them in the corridor. Let's have a strategy. Let's put something in place. That means we could put things in an orderly fashion that don't leave us exposed. So let's look at the risk management. Let's look at these different scenarios. Let's put something in place that actually is a blueprint for how we continue to work. And everybody's very clear what we do. So we develop policies and procedures that are realistic. Um, there's many other organizations I've been in where they've, you know, they've over-engineered something. And that's not what we want to do because over-engineering can leave us exposed. It can leave staff wanting to get around things. It could get to the point of it's so complicated, we just don't know how to actually do what you're asking us to do. Compliance management is a regular review on how we work. So there's one thing having it in place. There's another thing actually saying, is this right? Because it works. Have we, are we looking at these incidents? And a big section there is actually root cause analysis. Look at the problems. Sometimes it's not just about fixing what's happened. Look at the learning. Look what's happened to other businesses. Look at the incident logs. Is there a pattern? Is there something that we're missing? Um, is it a patch that's failing? And that comes down to the assessment to a real world environment. And the team development. Team development's massive. What We need everybody to buy into what we're doing. It's not there to rule with an iron fist. It's there to support them and how they deal with problems. Deal, And that's, we're gonna to touch about incidents in a minute, but you need your team to know you're approachable. And you need your team not to gossip or create a rumor mill. You need them to have a clear understanding on, on the previous three points of compliance management, policies and procedure, and risk management to understand what that next step is. Security posture and awareness. What well, are we doing? What is the reality of what we're doing? Is it still relevant what we're doing? Do we, are we looking after the guys who are in the field? I oh, just make sure they're okay. And that awareness is that training, 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 training. Uh, do we need to get a third party in to do the training? And we're going to talk about tabletop exercises in a minute. What we're delivering is actually okay. Are we competent to be able to train people? Testing and assessment and incident response. I'm going to leave those two there because we're going to talk about them shortly. But it all comes down to operational monitoring and the technical and systems control, which actually is usually very easy for technical people, particularly if the ISMS, um, sorry, the ISM, the Information Security Manager, is based in IT. Normally, a lot of this is very easy. What systems doing? What's the network doing? What are the endpoints doing? What are the applications up to? But it's probably the bottom three that are a misnomer. Yes, we know we got data, but do you know where it is? Do you know how you're handling it? Do you know what server it's on? Do you know who has access to that server? What happens when that server goes pop? What users have access to it? What privileges do they have? Are we checking permission creep? An emerging technology. 
we are still at that point where we're still only just managing bring your own device. How are we managing those devices coming into our network? How are we managing some of the kit, the gadgets they have, the Fitbits, the smart watches? How are we managing those? It's not saying you say no to them, but are we aware of them? So that, if I just go back a step, this is, this is the map we want to build. So our IS strategy connects to planning and management, operational monitoring, and the controls we put in place. How it works, does it still work? And what things are we putting in place to make sure it still works? And we're avoiding overcomplication, piling things on. So a part of our risk management approach, well, yes, the compliance standard says, you know, you should be doing this at least once a year. But what we want to happen is, if we continue, if we look at the root cause analysis, and we find out it's a particular person or particular department, particular system, what we're we doing about it? Are we going to do a whole new assessment for the whole business? Or are we just going to assess that one department? Or we're we going to go look back to our 90-day plan and say, what do we need to put in place to make sure this doesn't happen again? One. One thing I picked up a while ago from a fellow auditor was there shouldn't be a problem when it comes down to human error. Because human error means either we didn't test it properly or we didn't put the right controls in place. Take that how you will. I kind of agree with it. Because if a human was allowed to do that breach or to cause that system to fail, were they in the right place at the right time? Did they have the right privileges? Were they authorized? And that's where it comes down to our technical control management. Are we actually decommissioning products? There's a big emphasis on how we manage our data, as we already know, and how we deal with our physical media. Are we shredding it? Are we disposing of it properly? But actually, very rarely do we look at our technical controls and go, actually, are they fit for purpose? PCI DSS, which is a standard for payment cards, is very prescriptive on how you should manage your firewalls, manage your vulnerability assessments, manage your penetration testing. Where I saw 27,001, not so much. You might not want to go down that route, but actually there's any learning you can take from such things like payment cards. Training is the right training fit for purpose. We talked about it briefly. Uh, system order controls and this plan to check out lifecycle, which was our 90 days. You know, that's one that was an example of a way to put something in place to see if it works, if it's effective. What I like to do is split our risk management up into four areas risks opportunities, problems, improvements. Uh, this is my Ruppy index, if you like, for, for one of a better expression. We're going to look at risks. You know, it's, you know, it's all about the likelihood and the impact on a particular asset. You know, is it actually going to happen? What, what I would like you to do is come back to that learning, go back to that crisis, go back to what's happening with other businesses. Actually, could it happen to us? Not that we're a small campsite in the middle of somewhere. Wait a minute. According to this free website I'm reading and all these other websites, this particular system is really vulnerable. A classic example would be uh, Acrob um, Struts. That Struts uh, there was a vulnerability that affected a lot of systems. And yes, it might not affect you, but could it? And then you look at the likelihood and how many times it's impacting one a crisis and affecting businesses. So, and that's a year on, well, 14 months on. Just remember when you're dealing with risks, you're not just looking at the physical and the software parts. You know, they're, they're, they're probably the two most common ones. You deal with people, information, paper, services. You know, if you've got no electricity to your building, can you continue working? The company image and the reputation. 
they're very the typical things you always think about. But actually, that this learning thing, this thing I keep on drumming in since we started this presentation, is learning. Well, actually, learning can give us opportunities. It doesn't have to go wrong. It doesn't have to affect the business yet. There might not actually be a problem yet. But through analysis, we can go, wait a minute, could we do this better? Is there an opportunity that's come our way? That's different to improvements, but it's an opportunity that's come our way. It's gone, wait a minute, we should be doing this better. And legislative changes, well, GDPR. It's a big one. It's affecting European companies. It's affecting the UK. It's affecting all, all the companies that are servicing the EU. Well, what's the opportunity? Well, everyone's going to ask. <laughs> Probably some disgruntled people on this call now. The opportunity is that bit about looking after your data, understanding the information, understanding where it's held, who holds it, or how do we control it. And it's an opportunity to look within, but it's also an opportunity to look outside as well. When you talk to your suppliers and find out what your suppliers are up to, technological updates, new hardware, new software, these could be opportunities to go further. But the opportunity might be, wait a minute, we're using this system at the moment. Do we actually still need to be using the system? Is it legacy? Well, nothing's actually happened yet. We're running a legacy system. Nothing's actually happened yet. But actually, it could. We've got 90% of our customers on this new server. We've still got 10% of our customers on the legacy server. Is it worth it them still being on that 10%? Probably not. And that's where you've got that, that opportunity to review, to go further. And management changes as well. Actually physically moving people around, having new members of staff come in. Wait a minute, this is opportunity to let's look within again. What are we up to? Uh, companies who have particularly high turnover, an ISMS may help reduce that high turnover. And problems. Well, problems are things that we know about already. That's actually the incidents. But it's actually how we manage those incidents. Is this an event? Nothing's actually happened, nothing bad's happened. Is that actually an incident? Something's happened where we're going to have to try and resolve the consequence? Or is it just a non-conformity because a member of staff, somebody has breached a policy? But actually, these are massive opportunities to learn. Are we recording it? Are we recording it against our risks? Are we recording it against our opportunities? Is there a pattern? And again, it comes down to, well, what could we done to make this better? Is it training? Is that door broken? <laughs> Is the way we manage particular systems not fit for purpose? And improvements. Well, nothing has actually got to happen for an improvement. But this is where you encourage your staff to give reviews, give feedback, actually allow empowering staff can go a long, long way for them to buy into your IS strategy. It goes a long, long way for them to actually go, if something goes wrong, I can put my hand up with confidence to tell people what's happening and recognize the improvements that can be made without impacting the business. So, dear sir, sir in operations, if we do this, it will improve our security, but actually operationally, it'll save us 10 hours a week. Well, actually, that's a good thing because it's a cost saving. And actually having all these places in one central uh, repository, in one log, gives the ISMS team an opportunity to learn over different categories. So when you have your management review, at least once a year, you have better matrices to make sure your risk acceptance, your risk criteria are fit for purpose. You may find your objectives should change, your thresholds should change, your budget may even change because you're looking at the wider picture. You're looking at problems that have happened, problems that could happen, but you put some testing behind what you're trying to achieve. So manage your tra training. This is a big thing. And I've alluded to it already throughout this presentation. When you get presentation, when you do training, make sure it's relevant. 
And if you are getting third parties in, make sure they're actually qualified or at least have enough experience for you to go, yes, you are who you say you are. And these could be accredited professionals, accredited courses. So a person who delivers an accredited course doesn't have to be qualified in that area. They should have the necessary experience to deliver the accredited course. But the big thing is, do your research on your courses. Make sure it's actually going to fit a purpose because putting somebody on a course may help you with any of the, the previous four elements, risk, opportunities, problems, improvements. Sending your ISM in on a certain course, sending managers on a security awareness professional course and getting them to cascade it to the rest of your team. This is probably a bit self-advertising, but these are the four courses. These are the three courses I'm involved with. So instant response. Okay. Excuse me, have a quick drink. If it goes wrong, what are you going to do about it? Well, you hopefully should have an instant response plan. You should have a business continuity plan. But how have you created that? What information have you used in the first place to get to that point? Are you just looking within again? Or hopefully you should be now thinking, wait a minute, I'm going to use resources around me. What's happened to our competitors? What's happened to our industry? What's happened to our type of systems we've got? Call upon specialist firms. You don't have to call them because it's gone wrong. You don't have to call them because uh, you suspect a breach. Actually, these people, like ourselves, we're quite friendly people. We, we, we can have a phone call. We can have a chat. We can come and see what you're up to. We can actually help develop your plans, for example. Why? Because actually we're the ones who are doing the investigating in the first place. We've got a pretty good idea what's going on. That is your threat intelligence. We can supply you threat intelligence, for example. Ex-forces, police, agencies like that. These independents who have been in the army for like 23 years, for example. That's experience you just can't really train somebody up with. That's, that's happened over a long period of time. And actually, these are the sort of people who can make your plan fuller, more realistic. And what happens is you develop a playbook of incidents. You don't just have a one size fits all. You start developing incidents that could realistically happen to your business. And then you can practice them. You can actually see if they work. And that's something called tabletop exercises, which we'll come to in a minute. So part of your incident plan, your policy, should be about forensic readiness. And this is probably more of me telling you from experience. Try and understand what forensics is. Try and understand. Once you know where your data is, or you've got a good indication, and you're developing that maturity, you're developing those capabilities, you can feel confidence on how you would deal with potential evidence. Think the end game could be prosecution. Every time, end game, there could be prosecution. We could be prosecuting a member of staff. Somebody could be prosecuting us. That's the end game. It might not ever get that far. But if you think like that, you've got better chances of doing the containment element. If you start, for one of a expression, changing things, playing with things, and not understanding what you're doing with a network or with potential evidence, this could make the evidence unusable. To create a plan so that everybody in the organization knows what's to do. If they report a problem, that that device doesn't get turned off or doesn't get played with, or it's clearly identified as a no-go zone. But again, comes down to the previous slide, contact these people. So tabletop exercises. Tabletop exercises are very different to normal training. This is where you get specialists to learn about your business. They'll see your policies and see how you work. And what they'll do, they'll create a number of scenarios that are attested to your business. They'll get key people around the table, uh, like board, 
management, departments, and they'll run through a series of steps per scenario, throwing the occasional curveball in to see how you would react. A good tabletop scenario should quote your service, it should quote your systems. What it shouldn't be doing is scenarios that your business just don't do, don't have. Uh, for example, your uh, a chemical uh, analyst firm and the tabletop scenarios around fashion. It doesn't always fit. But this is an opportunity to actually test your incident response plan. Test your forensic readiness. And this might be just verbally discussing it through, or it could be to the point of the specialist firm will bring in hard drives, they'll bring in equipment for you to try. But what should come from it is learning. It'll shed light on areas that maybe not been thought of before, scenarios which are not in the incident response plan currently, but it gives you the opportunity to go that next step further. Okay, so my, my driver, my driver since I started this conversation, develop your information security to challenge the normal of your business, not just to meet compliance. Think about that maturity model and pushing it to the next step. Develop a realistic challenges. You know, think about actually what could happen to us? What suppliers have we got? Could we actually get them in in the tabletop exercises? And get help in from other businesses that know how. Uh, the police have specialists who can help businesses. 3B, for example, we are a specialist that can help other businesses. Don't just ring us when it all kicks off. We can be there beforehand. Okay, and thank you very much from me. Thank you, Peter, for this great presentation. I want to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for ISO 27032 Introduction Foundation and Lead Cybersecurity Manager. A PCB certificate will exemplify your dedication in implementing and managing cybersecurity processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Now, we'll leave the time to, take some, uh, to answer some of the questions from the attendees uh, regarding today's topic. The first question is, uh, what about users' awareness? So, what it comes down to training users is getting them to recognize not just your policies and procedures, because they don't need to know it inside out. What they least got to know is, what's the principles? What are the main things that affect their day-to-day? -day? They may not be interested in what finances day-to-day -day is, for example. So sometimes it's about customizing it to departments or roles and have role-based training. But when it comes to communicating, that's probably one of the biggest things. And that's like my 90-day plan. When technical people communicate outwards, it doesn't mean that the users are going to understand. Find out how they want to learn. And sometimes is the best. They may have team meetings. They may read certain bulletin boards. You, it's one of those, you've got to test the water to see what people are doing. There's great products out there as well, like Meta Compliance, for example, where it feeds information through. And it's better to show it dribs and drabs as well. And probably the last thing I'll say on that is when you do policy updates, sometimes that can be the biggest killer for members of staff. So actually, when you do a policy update, just highlight it. Highlight the bit that, that you've actually changed. So this is version two. This paragraph would just update some wording. So they don't feel like, oh no, not another policy. They go, okay, read the new paragraph. And you're making it realistic. And that comes back down to our improvements element. It gives them an opportunity to feed into your system. And then you've got a lovely um, symbiotic relationship with the rest of the users. Thank you, Peter. Now to add to that question, uh, another question is, how do we encourage organizations that are not even aware of the need? Yeah, that's, that's always the hard one. Scaremongering it seems to be the popular one, which I hate. I personally hate that. And it's seeing beyond the media. What you want them to do is that looking outward to look in. And 
saying, look, what do you have in place? Oh, I've got this. Well, did you know this, these systems got these in place? Let us have a look at what's going on. And that's where scaremongering doesn't work. You, you're going, oh, this could go wrong, and this could happen to your system. You just got to look at um, Meltdown Spectre. That was very big scaremongering, but it wasn't realistic. Coming in there on very, very technical points may not be the answer, but actually showing customers their opportunities, showing customers their opportunities and their, well, possibly their improvement elements is a softer touch then going hard in with the incidents and the it might go wrong bit because what you want to do is this develop this structure because again productivity breeds security security doesn't breed productivity they normally don't go the other way around thank you peter uh, another question is can you provide few insights into cyber insurance assurance or insurance insurance it's not really my specialist area, I'll be very honest. I, I feel I would do a disservice. Um, of the main things I would say is read the terms and conditions because if you don't have the an adequate structure in place that is defined, that could cause problems. Um, some insurance bodies would say you they're required to have 27,001 or they're required to have for example we've got a service called cyber essentials in the UK if they're being a bit vague it's probably worth clarifying because what you might think is good security they might not do um, so that's really it's still a bit fluffy even in the cluster that we are all cyber security specialists in our own field we still look at insurance documents and get confused. Thank you, Peter. Now, because of the time limitation, we will only answer one more question for today's session. Now, the last question is, which part from the capabilities you mentioned during the session we should uh, give more importance or focus more? <laughs> the, well, if I can, let's go flip back to it. You want the ones in green, purple, and blue to feed in to the business, technical, and threat intel. So if you like, the business, technical, threat intel are the important bits, but they won't exist without your planning, your management, and your operational elements. So in an ideal world, you want this whole map. What you may like to do is, well, I did it once or twice, is you take this diagram, but you turn it to like, uh, like a heat map, where you go, all right, we're really, really hot on planning and management. We're not so hot on operational monitoring. Okay. Can we make it better? Is there anything we can implement? Is there anything we need to change? Is it something we can physically do? That's the way to look at it. Um, but if you just trim it down, business technical threat intel, you're on the right path. Thank you, Peter. Now, to conclude the presentation, uh, can you say a few words on the difference between cybersecurity and information security? It's, it's very much the buzzwords. Cybersecurity very much focuses on the data side of things, the ones and zeros. And information security used to, so very much, I was going to say, used to very much focus on the paper and the physical. The reality is the two terms get blurred together now. Cyber, digital, information, security. In my world, they're all the same thing. You need to be managing information and information encompasses data. So end of the day, you need to know where, if it's readable and it can be linked to something on a screen or on a piece of paper, the security element of it is what you should be dealing with it. But yeah, cyber security is just, it's just another buzz term in my mind. Information security management system is the pinnacle wording, I suppose, for one of a better expression. 
Thank you, Peter, again for this very informative uh, presentation, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. I would like to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website as well as on our YouTube channel together with the slides of the presentation. For more information, you can visit our website www.pcb.com. Thank you all and have a great day.